The National Desk, America's News, now. Now, oil concerns. The Department of Energy will release another 15 million barrels. The move to deplete the nation's oil reserve that experts warn won't relieve the pain at the pump. Economic meltdown, world leaders wrestling with stubborn inflation while rent and food prices for Americans keep rising. It's hard enough right now just putting food on the table. Border battle, migrants turned away, others bust to New York City. Lawmakers demanding answers about Biden's border policy. Election countdown, the new numbers revealing what voters are thinking weeks ahead of election day. Plus, a look at some of the nation's red hot races. You can call me Trump and address any day. Look, I support safety and justice. And a four day work week, why some companies are shifting schedules and the research that backs it up. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Eugene Ramirez. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect. We start with the four big stories we've been following for you this week. Inflationary pressures remain strong. The Federal Reserve already considering another supersized rate hike in November. Russian President Vladimir Putin declaring martial law across parts of eastern Ukraine, with Russian militia now able to impose restrictions on travel and public gatherings. A new tent city for migrants bust to New York City. The growing controversy as President Biden uses Title 42 to turn away migrants at the southern border. And Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz receiving a life sentence instead of death. Florida lawmakers now reconsidering the state's death penalty rules. Another big topic making headlines this week, gas prices. The average nationwide sitting at $3.82 per gallon as of Friday. That's down eight cents from last week's average as both demand at the pump and the price of crude oil decrease amid recession fears. Now, to fight overall higher gas prices that we've been seeing, President Biden announced the release of half a million barrels of oil per day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve into the market in the month of December. Now, some critics calling that move irresponsible, saying clean energy policies are what's keeping the prices high. The National Desk Atra El Nashar dives into this debate. Less than three weeks until Election Day, President Biden trying to counter voters' disapproval of his handling of the economy by tapping into the nation's strategic petroleum reserve. The Department of Energy will release another 15 million barrels. Telling the Department of Energy to prepare for more releases if needed. The president says oil will be replenished when WTI crude is at or below $67 to $72 per barrel, about $12 lower than Wednesday's price. According to the Department of Energy, as of last Friday, the reserve held 405 million barrels, the lowest since 1984. The president's critics argue that's too low. If we were to have a hurricane in the Gulf or another uh, emergency, we would not be prepared. He's already used one third of it. But oil exchanges following hurricanes, when companies agree to replenish more oil than they took out, have historically ranged between one to five million barrels. Emergency drawdowns directed by presidents like after Hurricane Katrina and at the start of Operation Desert Storm have never exceeded 34 million barrels. Another political clash? Who's to blame for high prices? The president pointing to Russia's war, cuts by OPEC Plus, and oil and gas companies refusing to increase production. You should not be using your profits to buy back stock or for dividends. Not now. Not while a war is raging. Republicans and the oil industry say the president's efforts to shift away from fossil fuels have discouraged the production he's now calling for. A recent Harvard Caps Harris poll finds about two in three voters blame the president's policies for high gas prices. The question is, without President Biden on the ballot in these midterms, will voters still take out their frustration on Democrats? It's ridiculous. I'm very frustrated right now being a single mother and you know, just trying to take care of the kids and the home. It's funny that's politicized when something that's a worldwide problem. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Right now, many Americans also facing higher energy bills. New York State Electric and Gas proposing customers pay an extra $10.50 per month for gas delivery. Now, this increase is especially concerning to fixed income customers, many of which say they're already having a hard time making ends meet and simply can't afford to pay any more. I mean, I had to take on another job. I mean, I was hoping to be able to um, live on Social Security. I don't think I don't see that happening in the near future. People are already weighing whether they can afford their medication or their food for the week. It just doesn't make any sense. 
Well, some seniors say they're paying as much as double what they typically would for this time of year. And just ahead, our fact check team, investigative producers look at the significant difference in U.S. oil production between the current and past administrations and also what's behind it. With the recent series of interest rate hikes, the demand for mortgage loans has dropped to a 25-year low. The benchmark 30-year fixed mortgage rate hit 6.94 percent. That's the highest level since 2002. Mortgage applications have been in decline now for four months in a row, down to the lowest level since 1997. Also, fewer borrowers refinancing right now. The demand for those loans plunging 86 percent compared to the same week last year. Well, the IRS is adjusting income brackets for 2023 to account for the impact of inflation. Tax filers will see a 7% adjustment that could put them in a lower tax bracket. You can see those here on your screen. Now, the adjustment may also help keep workers who received a cost of living wage increase from moving to a higher tax bracket. This week, British Prime Minister Liz Truss announced her resignation after just 45 days in office. It's the shortest term served by any prime minister in the history of the United Kingdom. The Conservatives' announcement came one day after inflation in the U.K. hit 10.1 percent, the highest in 40 years. Her replacement is expected to be elected sometime next week. New data from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas shows older, educated, high earners are being hit hardest by inflation. Researchers found less than a third of workers in the lowest wage group experienced negative wage growth from before the pandemic to 2022. Meantime, college graduates had the most difficulty, along with workers over 56 years of age. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos says the economy is showing signs it's headed toward a recession, and now is the time, he says, to, quote, batten down the hatches. Economic growth and hiring have slowed as the Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates, hoping to tame rampant inflation prompting some layoffs in the tech industry. Now, Bezos joins the CEOs of Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. They've also recently warned a recession is on the horizon. In the battle over relocating migrants from border towns to northern sanctuary cities, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis now says he will hand over records related to the charter flight that Florida paid to send migrants from Texas to Martha's Vineyard. The governor's office initially pushed back against this lawsuit, asking for the immediate release of the files. Now, DeSantis then agreed to turn them over, but no later than December 1st. In September, the governor, you'll remember, took credit for that charter flight, sending 50 Venezuelan migrants to the island in Massachusetts in an alleged effort to bring attention to the Biden administration's border policies. But critics say what he did amounts to human trafficking and exploiting the migrants for his own political gain. In New York City, a camp packed with giant tents opened as housing for migrants bused to the city from border towns. City officials say the Humanitarian Relief Center on Randall's Island will now serve as a temporary shelter for single adult men, many of them from Venezuela. These tents include cots for up to 500 people, laundry facilities, a dining hall, and phones for the migrants to make international calls. Families with children are being housed at a hotel. The Biden administration making some big changes to immigration policy. The White House says it will allow 24,000 Venezuelan migrants to stay in the United States, but will send other migrants coming across the border back to Mexico using the pandemic era policy known as Title 42. The National Desk, Christine Frizzau, has reaction. On immigration policy, a pendulum swing by the Biden administration, now using Title 42, the pandemic-era public health policy, to expel Venezuelan migrants arriving at the southern border in record numbers, a policy his own Justice Department is fighting against and after President Biden said this. Is the pandemic over? The pandemic is over. They are fleeing a country in turmoil with a rise in violence and a lack of food and housing, often winding up in El Paso, Texas, where the city's Democratic mayor has bused about 10,000 to New York City, a practice leaders say will end once their challenges do. Meanwhile, Mayor Eric Adams has declared a state of emergency. These tents erected to help house them for now. This is unsustainable. The city is going to run out of funding for other priorities. It's a sentiment leaders from border states say they've been experiencing for years. The number one issue, bar none, is a wide open border, exposing them to the dangers of fentanyl pouring into communities, people dying, uh, empowered cartels, migrants dying on ranches. It is absolutely a, an abomination. He and others say they're worried about crime as well. Three undocumented immigrants were arrested just last week in El Paso in connection with a murder there in September. Meanwhile, immigrant advocates say Congress could deal with this today by updating immigration laws. But until they do, current laws should be followed.
under the current administration, Congress allows for asylum and we should follow the law and we should stop trying to skirt the law because we're scared that there's a large number of people who may be appearing to apply for asylum. The debate over the best policy now fully entrenched in politics. A New York Times Siena poll finding immigration tied with abortion as the third most important issue for voters this midterm election, following the economy and inflation. I'm Christine Frizzau, reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. As the Biden administration considers options to lower gas prices, we wanted to know how past presidents handled oil drilling right here at home. I'm back with our fact check team investigators. First, did President Trump's actions increase the country's oil production? Uh, Jenny, give us just the facts on this. Well, Eugene, we looked at U.S. Department of Energy data going back all the way to the 1860s. You see that there on your screen. Now, it shows that in 2019, during the Trump presidency, the country produced the most crude oil per day on record at over 12 million barrels. Now, we do want to note that in Trump's first year in office, the country was producing just over 9 million barrels per day, which was less than Biden's first year in office at just over 11 million barrels per day. Okay, and Connor, you were looking into some of the other administrations. Uh, what'd you come across? Well, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but the president has issued around 200 leases, and an analysis from the Wall Street Journal found that amounts to roughly 3% of what presidents from Eisenhower to Trump awarded in the same time span. That same analysis also found President Biden's Interior Department leased around 126,000 acres for drilling during his first 19 months in office. And no other president since Richard Nixon has leased out fewer than 4.4 million acres at this stage in their first term. Now, has that impacted gas prices? So far, we haven't seen an impact, and that's because it typically takes years to reach the market after federal leases are approved. However, this dropped off in leases is going to affect our supply in the future. All right, good to know. Ladies, thanks so much. And the Fact Check team will continue to follow developments on these and some other issues. You can also read this story with links to where they found their information on our website, thenationaldesk.com. Still ahead, Florida death penalty debate. Governor Ron DeSantis asking lawmakers for reform after a controversial verdict in the Nicholas Cruz trial. Plus, trick or treat troubles. Why some Halloween costumes and decorations may be tough to find this year. The National Desk team of reporters bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we start in South Carolina where a woman is sharing video of burglars breaking into her home in hopes of bringing them to justice. Middle of the day, broad daylight. I'm literally out in the middle of nowhere, nothing around me but trees um, and family. Becky Summy is talking about what she saw playing out in this video captured by surveillance cameras inside her home Monday while she was at work. This woman seen entering Summy's home on Syrup Mill Road in Ridgeway through a window. Shortly after, another woman making her way through Summy's bedroom, making off with prized possessions. I was keeping a pistol in my nightstand right beside my bed that I've had for probably about eight years or so. And uh, it was missing um, all of my jewelry and I don't wish it on anybody. 
also missing Summy's wallet, credit cards, digital devices, and Mary Kay products, amounting to more than $3,000. A crime Summy says she's thankful her cameras recorded, but leaves her feeling violated. The sad part is this was my childhood home, and I have been trying to remodel and update and bring it current. My plan today is to go buy more cameras. Summy now working to get over the emotional toll of what she believes is a targeted attack. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis wants state lawmakers to reform the state's death penalty law after Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz received a life sentence instead. Florida used to allow a majority jury vote for a death sentence, but that law was changed in 2017 to require a unanimous decision, which is how Cruz avoided the death penalty. DeSantis supports reverting back to the old law, but other lawmakers aren't so sure. I'd have to really study the legislation if it came to us. But I don't think we should have knee-jerk responses just because we are upset by one particular result. Um, it's a very complex, very difficult issue, and we're talking about human life, no matter how good or bad that life may be. It's unknown if the governor's office is working on any specific legislation for this at the moment. In Washington, D.C., fun Halloween staples, baby, hard to come by this year thanks to inflation. Due to limited supply and high demand, Halloween costumes and decorations may not be as common in stores as we're used to seeing. Now, if you find some, expect prices to be higher. Similar to last Halloween, I know that they've had some supply chain issues, so if you see a costume you like, get it. Okay, it may, it may not be there when you come back tomorrow. Now, when it comes to candy, there's going to be plenty of that, but you may notice fewer pieces in each bag. That's due to shrinkflation. Still ahead, the cost of crime. Retired Sheriff Curry Myers weighs in on what's fueling a surge in violent crime and the toll it's taking on our police departments. New developments in several criminal investigations we've been following for you this week. In California, the accused Stockton serial killer made his first court appearance. Wesley Brownlee was formally charged with three counts of murder and firearms charges. Also in a California courtroom, the brother of the man accused of murdering a family of four in Merced. Alberto Salgado is accused of helping his brother destroy evidence. He pleaded not guilty. And in Oklahoma, the person of interest in the shooting and dismemberment of four men is now in police custody. He was arrested in Florida on an unrelated grand theft charge. With a little more than two weeks to the midterm elections, voters rank surging crime rates as one of their top concerns, second only to inflation. So how will this affect the midterm vote and what are some possible solutions to address violent crime across the country? This week, our Jan Jeff coach spoke with senior visiting fellow with the Texas Public Policy Foundation and retired sheriff Dr. Curry Myers. You've had 30 years of law enforcement experience, so talk to me a little of what you've seen happening with officers and with this rising crime right now through the decades of experience you've had, and also what you think it's going to take to recruit people to back to the force. Well, we just recently seen some Harris polling that has shown that uh, over 90% of the public is concerned about the financial situation going on in America. 
uh, and that financial security is is problematic for them. We also see it, the same poll showing in the upper 80s where people are worried about physical security, their own security. And you put those two things together, uh, that means people are really uh, concerned about the future and it's going to affect the, the midterms. Yeah. Right now, law enforcement officers are really concerned throughout the country. They don't feel like they're appreciated. And anytime you have those issues, uh, you're gonna have problems. Right, and to your point, the, the Harvard Caps Harris Poll survey found 68% of voters said crime was a very important issue. 26% said that crime is somewhat important. What do you attribute to the increase in the crime that we are seeing? Well, we're not taking care of recidivism. Uh, recidivism is a huge problem in this country uh, and, and we have to direct resources towards uh, reducing recidivism. Recidivism right now for violent offenders is up around 63%. 63% uh, will reoffend in the, uh, 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 once they get out of prison uh, within the next three years. It goes up to about 65% after about five years. Uh, and we have uh, woke prosecutors that are not actually putting people back in prison uh, when they should be in prison based on their recidivist behavior. That's one thing. The second one is that we have an issue with bail reform and we are letting people out, especially violent offenders again, that should be in prison. So you put uh, the fact that we're not sentencing people who are reoffending back in prison and if they are offending, we're letting them out on bail reform. Those two things together are problematic. Senator Chuck Grassley, ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, put it this way, quote, this report shows that homicide is the biggest problem. We have been seeing about 6,000 additional killings per year for the past couple of years. It also shows increased rates of rape and most narcotic crimes. And the data set doesn't even include complete information from some of America's biggest cities with the highest crime rates like Los Angeles, New York, or Phoenix. The chickens have come home to roost for the anti-law enforcement movement, anti-police rhetoric, de-policing, progressive prosecution policies, and out-of-whack bail reforms are the driving factors in this public safety crisis. Can we even begin to get a handle on getting crime under control, Sheriff, if one of the underlying problems, as Senator Grassley says, as you have said, that we have these soft on crime policies from progressive prosecutors? Well, the other problem as well is they're defunding police. So we have a, a reduced budgets, reduced manpower that's going on across the country. And when you put that together with the fact that we have these kind of woke policies, it's affecting crime even worse than what it could be under the current economic situation. So when you have bad uh, economies, often crime increases because people are committing crimes and organized crime starts, starts to really look at what kind of crimes they can, can commit. Uh, but, but right now it's problematic and I'm concerned that law enforcement is not being funded adequately. They need to be funded and not through fines, fees, and forfeitures. They need to be funded through general funding. And then the other issue we have is we, we have a huge recruitment, retention, and retirement problem going on in the United States right now. We're just not able to attract police officers, keep people, uh, keep officers on the job. And finally, and most importantly, we have officers retiring early and leaving the force, which is gonna be a huge void for law enforcement in the future, especially in leadership. We're not gonna have senior officers out on the field that will be able to help younger officers deal with the public. Sheriff, what's it gonna take? What's it gonna take to recruit more, more officers? Well, we have to be pro-police. We have to understand that police are out here to do a job. There are opportunities for improvement in law enforcement, and we need to focus on those opportunities. Uh, we have one of the finest criminal justice systems in the world, there's no problem. But the first thing is we need to focus on violent crime. We need to make sure that we're addressing violent crime first. We need to fund police and fund them through adequate uh, means, that's through general funds, not through fines, fees, and forfeitures. I've, met, I've written many papers on the fact that we um, many um, cities are supplanting budgets with fines and fees. For instance, the city of Chicago has uh, camera speed cameras that are throughout uh, their city 
and they're using it as forms of revenue to supplant police budgets. Uh, and that it causes a problem between the police and the community anytime we use uh, policing for profit. So we have to fund law enforcement appropriately, number one, and we have to support them. And we have to make sure that they are well-trained and, uh, and we can recruit people, which means that we're probably gonna have to increase the amount of pay and benefits as a result of, uh, uh, of the culture that we're living in right now. Retired Sheriff Dr. Curry Myers, we appreciate you joining us here on the National Desk. Hope you have a great Thank week. Thank you so much. A football playing teen making history in California. Still ahead, the moves that got her noticed by the LA Rams. Plus, more top stories making headlines this week. Next on this weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. We're back now with a look at the top stories trending on our website right now. A city hall in Washington state took down its Halloween display after complaints from residents. That display featuring a Karen scarecrow, you see it here, sporting a, can I speak to a manager, t-shirt. An unusual white mask washing up on an Oregon beach this week. A viewer posted this video to Facebook. Now others responded it was a globster or an unidentified decaying whale carcass. And a California teen making history by becoming the first female to score two touchdowns in a game. Bella Rasmussen is a standout football star at Laguna Beach High School where she plays against the boys. Those stories and more are on our website right now, thenationaldesk.com. And looking ahead to the stories we're following for you in the coming days, on Tuesday, the next Consumer Confidence Index is set for release. Now, that report gives economists some perspective on how consumers feel about their current financial situation. For the last two months, confidence has gone up. WNBA star Brittany Griner set to appeal her drug smuggling conviction in Moscow in this coming week. Experts say it is highly unlikely the court will overturn her conviction, but the panel could reduce her current nine-year prison sentence. And Eyes to the sky Tuesday for the last solar eclipse of the year, just not here in the U.S. The partial eclipse will only be visible in parts of Europe, Western Asia, and Northeastern Africa. Still ahead, my conversation this week with insider economy reporter Ben Wick on grocery store prices. Why groceries right now are outpacing other spending categories, and could corporate greed be playing a role in that? Plus, midterm election push. President Biden on the campaign trail with nearly two weeks left. The promise he's making to voters if Democrats retain control of Congress. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget you can watch us live weekdays 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern Time. And of course, anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back.
The National Desk, America's News, now. Much of the focus these midterms is on control of Congress, but some big races will determine who will run your state. We're taking a closer look at the governor matchups. Student loan forgiveness legal challenges. The claims from the latest lawsuit against President Biden's program. And debt relief for thousands of our nation's farmers. How much of the more than a billion dollars in federal assistance has been given out so far? This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Eugene Ramirez. Less than three weeks until the 2022 midterm election and early voting turnout already higher than usual as millions of eager voters return their ballots. A New York Times Siena poll showing the economy and inflation top of mind for voters right now, followed by abortion, immigration and crime. Now, the poll also giving Republicans a slight edge now with 49 percent of likely voters planning to vote Republican versus just 45 who plan to vote Democrat. Now, while much of the focus is on the struggle over the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives, some of the most heated races happening right now are over governor's seats. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman shows us why these races are already record breaking. Voting already underway. Control of Congress may dominate the headlines, but the governorships of growing importance. Across the country, 36 seats are up for grabs. 12 are considered key battlegrounds. 10 right now held by Democrats, two by Republicans. For Democrats, in strongholds from New Mexico to New York to Oregon, where they haven't lost the governor's mansion in four decades, trouble. Tina Kotek stood with defund the police extremists. Crime concerns opening the door for the GOP, enough so the co-founder of Nike is now backing the Republican. And President Biden made a rare trip there last week to stump for his party's nominee. This is, I think, the most important off-year election. The nearly $50 million spent so far smashing previous records. In Arizona. You can call me Trump in address any day. The GOP gambling on a controversial Trump acolyte to keep that seat from a Democrat who seems unsure if she even wants Biden's help as he's often blamed for the teetering economy. These matchups getting more nationwide attention since state leaders are frequently using their power to impact policies like immigration, abortion and election security. A textbook example in Georgia. We need a governor who believes in access to the right to vote right. and not in voter suppression. We've seen turnout increase over the years, including with minorities. And another first this midterm cycle. More women than ever before. A record 25 nominated by major parties. And in five states, it's women going toe to toe. Also a first. I will do everything in my power as a woman, as a Michigander, and as your governor. To but it's how these candidates would govern, party loyalty, policies, and the ever-important economy certain to sway voters. In Washington, Scott Thuman for the National Desk. Well, this week, President Biden made perhaps his most direct call yet for Democrats to hit the polls this November, making a bold promise if Democrats hold majorities in Congress. And folks, if we do that... Here's the promise I make to you and the American people. The first bill that I will send to the Congress will be to codify Roe v. Wade. And when Congress passes it, I'll sign it in January, 50 years after Roe was first decided the law of the land. Now, right now, there's not enough support in the Senate to end the 60-vote filibuster to codify abortion rights. President Biden's speech shows he's attempting to elevate abortion rights as a top issue ahead of midterm elections. But polls show the economy and rising prices are of greater concern right now to American voters. Now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture offering debt relief to thousands of farmers struggling financially. This week, the agency announced more than 13,000 farming operations have received nearly $800 million so far. Most of the farmers have direct and guaranteed farm loans that are now past due. That money comes from the $3.1 billion as allocated for farmers under the Democrat-led Inflation Reduction Act. Americans paying more for just about everything these days as the Biden administration struggles to wrangle in high inflation. Now, where it's perhaps most noticeable is that that weekly trip to the grocery store. Insider economy reporter Ben Wink with us tonight. Ben, welcome to the National Desk. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be here. Our pleasure. Overall, inflation was up 8.2 percent year over year in September, but grocery prices, Ben, those were up 13 percent. Now, why are groceries being hit harder? It's one of those tougher categories when you look at things like food and, and household necessities. 
um, where demand for those goods is pretty much always there, right? People need to eat, people need to keep their homes stocked with things like toilet paper, uh, paper towels, cleaning supplies. And so rarely does demand fall. So companies see that and they can keep raising prices, even when prices for some other things like you know, gasoline, for example, that's a lot more volatile and that can drop or, or climb depending on how supply is. But with food and, and some of those household necessities, it's, it's pretty steady. And, uh, and since demand is steady, so are those price increases. Now you say companies notice this and they raise their prices. Do you think part of this is not just uh, supply chain issues and, and other things? It's also just companies being a little greedy? Are they also increasing their profit margins? It's a little bit of everything, right? Uh, you can't have inflation without some uh, you know, companies making sure that the costs go on to the consumer. Um, but I, I think it is, it's tough to parse just how much is, is driven by any one factor. Um, it's definitely down to supply chain issues down to uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, that impacting a lot of commodity prices, right? So you look at how that's impacted uh, the price of, of gasoline, that goes into uh, transportation costs, mm -hmm. that makes shipping some foods more expensive, right? So sure. it's all part of this big web and, and company uh, corporate greed, you know, their, their margins, that definitely plays a role, but it's not the whole picture. Yeah, I wanna talk about American spending habits at the grocery store. Many people now adjusting uh, the way they shop, some switching to store brand products, others shopping at uh, low price stores, like Aldi is a, a lower price uh, grocery store. With no end in sight to these higher prices, do you see any long-term effects uh, as far as you know how big brands and the traditional retailers might be affected? Will people just continue to shop at the lower end stores and, uh, and, and buy store brands instead? I think what you mentioned when it comes to consumer behavior is definitely going to stick around for a while, right? You're going to see a lot of those uh, brands that are able to offer low prices and discounts. They're going to do pretty well as long as inflation is running really hot and people need to go buy those necessities but don't want to be spending more than they have to. Um, and I'd say as far as uh, the companies go in these, and you mentioned retailers as well, we're starting to see discounts uh, pop up, you know, just not se separate from the holiday shopping season, but as companies find themselves with a lot of inventory or they might have over ordered in order to um, kind of uh, equalize the supply demand imbalance. So from these companies and from, from what they're doing, I think you could start to see uh, some more widespread discounting. Mm -hmm. And then companies that want to compete and, and grab some of those uh, shoppers who are looking for low prices, they might start to compete with each other and uh, try to offer shoppers the best deal. Yeah, and those are little quick fixes uh, for the short term. Uh, and we're running out of time here, but if you can quickly uh, just let us know, and, and with your research, uh, how long is this going to go on for? How much longer are we going to see these higher prices, especially at the grocery store? So they're definitely going to last into 2023, but I think by this time next year, you'll see inflation come down quite a bit. It's not going to be back to that kind of 2% target that the Fed is looking for, but We'll be pretty close, and I think uh, looking further out into 2024, we'll be in a much healthier spot if things continue to go the way they're going. Great insight. Insiders, Ben Wink, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. The application for the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness program is now available on the Department of Education's website. Now, the form is short. It doesn't require supporting documents for now. The Department of Education may request additional information at a later date, however. And President Biden said the beta testing site has already handled more than 8 million applications without a glitch. As millions of people fill out the application, we're going to make sure the system continues to work as smoothly as possible so that we can deliver student loan relief for millions of Americans as quickly and as efficiently as possible. For those who cannot apply online, a paper version of the student loan forgiveness form is expected soon. A CDC advisory panel voted this week to add COVID vaccines to the routine immunization schedule for children. Now, right now it's unclear how this could affect the list of vaccinations required for kids to attend school as laws in several states automatically adopt all CDC guidelines. Local school board races have become a battleground for parents to push back against the status quo in education. I'm back with our fact check team, Connor and Courtney. And Courtney, you were looking into how school board meetings have changed since the pandemic. What'd you find? They've been controversial with parents arguing about those low test scores we talked about earlier and race and gender issues. We've seen a bunch of rowdy school board meetings around the country with some going viral and others even requiring law enforcement intervention. Here's another interesting fact that puts things into perspective. Reuters surveyed 33 board members across 15 states and found those members alone received over 200 threatening messages. The former chair of Loudoun County who faced controversy over a trans student policy received over half of those messages with over 20 of them threatening her life. Yeah, they've definitely gotten heated those meetings and I know Connor school board elections have historically had low turnout uh, but 
have these elections gained more interest now? They sure have, Eugene, and political groups are becoming much more involved. We found that there are political action committees that are funneling millions of dollars into these campaigns. And here's an example. Last year, the right-leaning 1776 Project PAC became the first national PAC to target local, historically nonpartisan school boards. So far, the group has spent around $2 million between last April and this August, and have endorsed more than 100 school board candidates. So far, they claim a 70% success rate. And here's another example. California's Republican Party has started a program called Parent Revolt to recruit and train candidates for school board seats. And some big name, high profile politicians are also getting involved in this. That's right. And a clear example of that is Governor Ron DeSantis. He's backed 30 candidates that ran in Florida, and at least 20 have won their election. The bottom line is school board meetings and elections have become a hot button issue as we approach the midterms. And we're seeing much more involvement from parents politicians and political groups. Yeah, we sure are. Ladies, thank you so much for your work on this. The Fact Check team will continue to follow developments on these and other issues. You can also read this story with links to where they found their information on our website, thenationaldesk.com. Just ahead, the lingering effects of Hurricane Ian. A major Florida crop still reeling. The damage done to citrus production as issues mount for farmers. The National Desk team of reporters bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we begin in Washington state with an ongoing legal battle. A family there blaming the city of Seattle for their son's death. It was like yesterday to me. You know, every day I'm dealing with this. The fight to get justice for her son is not over for Danita Sinclair. In June of 2020, the Capitol Hill organized protest known as CHOP formed around several city blocks as Seattle police abandoned the East Precinct during protests over George Floyd's death. It was inside CHOP, Sinclair's son, Lorenzo Anderson, was shot multiple times. First responders unable to get inside CHOP to give Anderson aid. Despite the fact that they knew he'd been shot, he, they were warned that he'd been shot, they did nothing. They stood idly by outside the barricades because of Seattle official policy that they would not cross the barricades of the no cop zone that had been created in CHOP. An attorney for the city blamed a miscommunication between police and fire. These facts are tragic, but the 14th I mean, Amendment. People are dying, counsel, and, and not just one. I mean, at what point do we draw the line and say enough is enough? What happened here was totally unacceptable. Money can never bring back my son, so it's about the accountability on what was right, right from wrong. On our grove, we lost, we figure, about 25%. Um, you still see some of the effects from fruit falling, you know, days and weeks after. Shacked Groves near Vero Beach grows oranges and grapefruit on about 105 acres. Hurricane Ian winds didn't knock down any trees, but the fruit is another story. It was enough to blow off, especially your heavier fruit, your grapefruit and navel oranges and stuff that was hanging heavy on the tree. The damage here, just another thing that will impact costs. And I don't know about dramatic, but it's it'll be, uh, 
it'll be noticeable to the eye, just like pretty much everything else in the in the uh, grocery store for sure. Florida orange production for 2022-2023 down 32% from last season, and grapefruit production down 40%. And that forecast doesn't even include the impact of Hurricane Ian. The main reason for the ongoing decline is citrus greening, a bacteria that stunts the growth of the fruit. We try to, to battle the disease by tree, keeping the tree as healthy as possible. Today, local environmentalists applauded Austin ISD for clearing the air with a move away from diesel fuel. As we do know, diesel exhaust is a carcinogen. And so uh, electric school buses are just a win-win-win. And the district's move is a first for the Lone Star State. That is being first in the state in committing to go all electric with this fleet of buses. Austin ISD won't be alone on the road to all electric. Cap Metro already has 12 electric buses on the streets. And we have 66 electric buses on order. So we've made the commitment to fully electrify our fleet by about 2035. Like Cap Metro, the district will start small. Our 2022 bond package will also include an opportunity to fund more buses and committing to an all electric fleet by 2035. And supporters want the district's plan to include retraining existing workers to operate and maintain the new electric buses. We not only should respect the environment that we're trying to protect, but in the process, we can't leave behind workers. And still to come, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from Election Day to the Fed's next move to counter inflation. That's next on the National Desk. Our Washington Bureau covers Capitol Hill in D.C. every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. For some perspective on what's happening in the nation's capital and on the campaign trail, I'm joined by Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman and National Correspondent Atra Elnishar. Scott, just over two weeks until Election Day and President Biden's actions ahead of the midterms have some asking if he's giving up wooing independence and simply playing to the liberal Democratic base. Yeah, it's a debate going on right now, Steve, wondering... Uh, what exactly the president's goal is when he's out on the campaign trail, but more specifically, what he's doing policy-wise. And you take a look at just, for example, some of the latest moves we've seen, erasing uh, student loan debt, um, pardoning marijuana offenses, going after big oil, um, vowing that if Republicans were to pass any sort of nationwide ban on abortion, that he would veto it. These are issues that a lot of people believe cater a little bit more to the left than to the moderates, who helped get President Biden in office and how he was often marketed. The reason it matters is because if the president decides he's going to cater a little bit more toward uh, what some people would call left issues or the young vote, which is something s Democrats certainly need uh, to get uh, victories this November, um, does that take away from centrist or moderate voters? It's often said that elections are won in the middle because the base is gonna show up no matter what for Republicans or Democrats. Bernie Sanders, who knows quite a bit about gathering youth vote, has said that he's concerned about not seeing the kind of energy he wants. So maybe this is playing into that, and it's all a wise strategy. The danger, though, is alienating some of those independents that we've talked about, Steve, because there is new polling from New York Times-Siena that shows 
that right now Republicans enjoy a 10 point lead when independents are asked which party they are most likely to vote for this fall. Uh, 51 to 41 percent Republicans over Democrats. Why does that matter? Well, back in September, it was the inverse and it was a three point advantage for Democrats. So what's causing that shift? Is it the president's latest moves? Are the policies actually hurting electoral chances for Democrats? We won't know until Election Day, of course, but this is why it's fun to debate. Well, in Atra, one of the biggest issues, in fact, the biggest issues for voters, the economy and inflation as we head into the fall and winter holiday season. How are Americans' wallets faring? Well, we're seeing a lot of mixed signals. On one hand, poll after poll shows that Americans feel very sour about the economy. 64% of workers say it's harder to pay for living expenses than it was a year ago, according to a new Paltrick survey. Uh, on the other hand, household balance sheets remain really strong. Uh, this week, Bank of America reported that uh, the amount of money that their customers are depositing into their accounts is still multiple times what it was before the pandemic. American Express's CEO also just came out late this week saying that they haven't seen a change in consumer spending. But you've also still got, despite this you know, strong balance sheet situation and a strong labor market, you've still got 68% of voters saying they either think we're already in a recession or they think one is coming in the next six months. That's according to a new CNBC survey. So these mixed signals, uh, as even the Fed acknowledges, is what they are, is making it difficult for them. And they've got the strongest policy tools, by the way, to fight inflation. It makes it difficult for them to do that. Something that stuck out to me this week, Steve, was when Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari said his confidence in being able to foresee where inflation will be in six months is very, very low. And we know if there's one thing the American people, and certainly the markets hate, it's uncertainty. Yes, all of this looming over the election on November 8th. National correspondent Audra Elnishar, chief political correspondent Scott Thuman. Thank you both. Eugene. Back to you. And a big thanks to our Capitol Hill team. The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack wants to review more emails from former President Trump's attorney, John Eastman. A federal judge is ordering Eastman to provide all communications with attorneys working on election litigation for Trump. Now, he must also hand over materials related to a proposal for former Vice President Mike Pence to disrupt certification of the 2020 election. Former Trump advisor Steve Bannon has been sentenced to four months in prison for contempt of Congress. A jury found Bannon guilty earlier this year for refusing to testify and supply documents to the January 6th committee. He's the first person in decades to be incarcerated for contempt of Congress. New documents reveal the Trump Organization charged the Secret Service excessive rates to stay at Trump hotels while protecting former President Trump and his family. The documents released by the House Oversight Committee show Trump's company charged agents more than the government rate in at least 40 instances. In one example, agents had to pay as much as $1,815 per night. That's more than five times the government rate. The review suggests it costs U.S. taxpayers at least $1.4 million over the course of four years. Remote work is among the perks companies are now offering to attract and keep workers since the pandemic. Coming up, how some companies are taking it a step further, offering a shorter work week.
The pandemic becoming a game changer in the workforce as more companies embrace non-traditional policies hoping to attract and keep workers. The National Desk Angela Brown shows us how companies around the world are experimenting now with a four day work week. Before becoming president, Richard Nixon forecasting in 1956 four day work week as the future. Captured in this article from the New York Times, it turns out the future is 2022 with nonprofits like Four Day Week Global leading the charge. One thing that's certainly been a game changer in terms of moving this from something that was still quite a niche idea a few years ago to something that's much more mainstream now at the very least has been the pandemic. Four Day Week Global operating a six month pilot program in the UK. More than 70 companies, over 3,300 employees, all working a four day work week. I absolutely believe that a four day work week can be the golden handcuffs that keep your good people. Career specialist Julie Bauke is tracking the UK pilot program right here in the US. Four Week Global just releasing this update. 41 companies responding to their survey. 88% say the four day work week is working well for their business. They have time to get their doctor's appointments in, to exercise, to pursue hobbies, to be more mentally ready to work hard the other four days. But some companies are leery. Entrepreneur listing some possible drawbacks, including customer service availability, scheduling issues, increased pressure on employees to get work done in four days. But in the majority of situations, we're talking about employees moving to a four day work week, but devising rosters and schedules that ensure that you've got adequate coverage so that the business can continue to operate on a five day basis. The six month trial is halfway complete in the UK. Other results indicate 46% of respondents say their business productivity has maintained around the same level, while 34% report that it has improved slightly and 15% say it has improved significantly. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Well, that does it for this weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget you can watch us live 6 a.m. till 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern Time weekdays. Check your local listings for that. You can also watch online and catch up with the latest headlines at thenationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Eugene Ramirez. Have a great rest of your weekend.